بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين حمدا كثيرا طيبا مباركا فيه كما يحب ربنا عز وجل ويرضى وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله بلغ الرسالة وأدى الأمانة ونصح الأمة وجاهد في الله تعالى حق الجهاد حتى أتاه اليقين فصلى الله عليه أو على آله وأصحابه ومن سار على منهاجه ودعا بدعوته إلى يوم الدين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته My dear brethren Brothers and sisters in Al Islam. Maybe four years ago in Windsor, Connecticut, in Masjid Medina, I did a lecture and it was about the importance and the necessity and the virtue of studying, learning, reading, and reviewing the prophetic seerah. To study, to review, to learn, to familiarize yourself with the seerah of Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam. And in that lecture we mentioned many, many things. Maybe two and a half years ago, if not three years ago, in Carnarcee, Brooklyn, I did a lecture at Masjid Khalid ibn al-Walid entitled, The One Whom You Claim to Love. The One Whom You Claim to Love. In which we spoke about the appalling condition of many of us I can't free myself, as Yusuf mentioned, he said, I can't free myself. But the appalling condition of many of us regarding our factual information, what we actually know about this man whom we claim to love, Muhammad, what do we know about him? His name, where he was born, what year he was born, his household, his lineage how old he was, etc. What do we actually know about him? What do our children know about the Prophet ﷺ? Not all Muslims, but many of us have an appalling condition regarding this. So in those two lectures, I explained to the brothers and the sisters there in those two states and in those two cities that learning the seerah of the Messenger of Allah ﷺ is a necessity. As we're going to read tonight, inshallah, is a necessity. And not only is it a necessity, not only is it mandatory, but it's something which is extremely fruitful. Muthmira is fruitful. There are trees that are important to the environment. They give oxygen, carbon monoxide, etc. But our trees don't bear fruit. So the tree in itself always has a virtue. And the tree always has an importance. And the tree in the life of the human being has a necessity. But it doesn't always mean that the tree is what? Muthmira, fruitful. So there's a lemon tree, apple tree, cherry tree, walnut tree, chestnut tree, plum tree, etc. All these different types of trees that provide shade, that give oxygen, trees that help the ecosystem, the balance in the environment, the insects, the birds that live in the tree, on the tree, and the list goes on. And on top of all of that, there are trees that give man, birds and animals, but specifically man, sweet, tasty fruit. And that is the seal of the Prophet it's something that you need to breathe, it's oxygen. It's something that has an importance and an excellence, and it gives you a daily tangible benefit. A daily tangible benefit. And the closest way, the fastest way, the shortest way, bi'idhnillah to Allah, and to the abode of His nobility and His honor and His generosity, is nothing more than the Prophet That's the closest way. Just like you have two points, the closest, fast way is a straight line. Straight line. So when the Messenger of Allah وسلم, in the authentic hadith, in the Sahih, when he wanted to visit his neighbor, who was a Jew, wasn't a Muslim, wasn't someone that was his companion, someone who believed him, was a Jew. So the Jewish man had a son. And the Prophet وسلم, heard that the son was very sick, very ill, on his deathbed. Death was knocking on his door. And he saw the young boy. And the very first thing that the Prophet said to the young boy, he told him to make the shahada. He said, say, la ilaha illallah. Obviously, the young boy had a great deal of awe and respect for his father, even though he knew it was the truth. And if he did know it was the truth, then he wouldn't have even sought his father's permission. So he looked towards his father. What should I do? Can I obey this man, Abu al-Qasim, Muhammad? Is he the messenger of Allah? And subhanallah, how mighty is Allah Azza wa 
to soften someone's heart, but at the same time to make their heart like a rock and a stone. At one time, his heart was soft, and another time, it was solid. The Jewish man, he didn't make the shahada, but he told his son, he says, Atta Abu al Qasim. He says, Obey him. Obey Abu al Qasim. Listen to him. So that's a type of softness. His son is about to die. Why is he telling his son to accept the religion of these Arabs, these backwards pagans, these Ummiyin, those whom we can rob and steal and fornicate with their wives? We can cheat them, we can give them interest. They're animals, basically. They're not Jews. They're not descendants of Yaqub. They're not descendants of Ishaq. They're descendants of Ishmael. We can do whatever we want to them. But at the same time, Allah softened his heart to tell his son to take the shahada and to accept the iman. But at the same time, he himself didn't take it. He says, Atta Abu al Qasim. He says, Obey this man, Abu al Qasim. So the young boy, he took the shahada. He accepted Islam on his deathbed. And the Messenger of Allah he said, Alhamdulillah, anqadahu bi min al nar. He says, All praises for Allah who used me to save him from hell. I was the reason behind him being delivered from the hellfire. And if he's not going to the hellfire, then maybe the night time he's going to Jannah. كُلُّ نَفْسًا ذَائِقَةُ الْمَوْتِ وَإِنَّمَا تُوَفَّوْنَ أُجُورُكُمْ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ فَمَنْ زُحْزِ عَنِ النَّارِ وَأُدْخِلَ الْجَنَّةَ فَقَدْ فَازِ Allah says, every soul shall taste the bitterness of death. And you will only be giving your deeds in full. You'll be only giving your deeds in full, meaning that you will be given a taste of your deeds before this day. And that's the barzakh, the grave. But that's a different discussion, the tafsir of that ayah. Allah says, You'll only be giving your deeds in full on the day of judgment. Highlighting point, Allah says, So anyone who's removed far from the fire, and placed in paradise, then he's successful. So therefore, if a person is saved from the hellfire, then his Masir, his destination is where? It's paradise. So that was a short, quick, direct way to Jannah, was Muhammad. So the seerah of the Prophet والسلام, isn't optional. It's not something I can read about, I can learn about. It's mandatory. It's mandatory. And not only is it mandatory, not only is it important, but it's also fruitful. It gives you immediate guidance. You may read a book of this one, of this person, of this issue, of this, and you may not get direct guidance. When you read the Prophet Sallallahu his life, what he did, what he said, what he didn't do, what he didn't say, you're getting direct organic guidance. You're taking it from the raw source. And not from a second hand, a third hand, this additive, this color, etc. It's raw, right from organic. Is your garden in the backyard? I have cucumbers, tomatoes, potatoes, radish, carrots. I take it out of the ground, take it into my kitchen, rinse it off in the sink, chop, chop, chop. There's no farmer, there's no pesticides, there's no truck, there's no plastic. That's the seed of the Prophet. It's fruitful. So, Bidhi Nai Ta'ala, in these coming weeks and in these coming months, we want to start, inshallah, a course a series on the Sirah to Nabawiyah, the prophetic Sirah, not the Sirah of the Khulafa Rashidin, the companions of Bakr, Siddiq, Umar, Uthman, Ali, the Ten Kimpramit, La, not the Sirah of the four Imams of Islam, but the Sirah of Muhammad, alayhi salatu was salam. Mm -hmm. That's what we're going to talk about, inshallah. Uh, and for lack of time, we don't want to re, uh, reiterate those points that we mentioned in those two lectures years ago. If you get a chance, please go back to them and take down the points that we have mentioned about why it is important to study the seerah, why it is necessary to study the seerah, and what is so beneficial and fruitful about studying the seerah. And we've mentioned to you just now a few points, a few points. So the book that we're going to use, inshallah, um, is a small book that's taken from a bigger book, like many books in Al-Islam. The book has been titled Tahdibu Sirat al a summary of the prophetic seerah of Al Hafid al Nawawi, Rahimahullah. But that's not the original book. Al Nawawi, he wrote a bigger book called Tahdibu al Asma' al Asma' wal Lugat, or al Lugat wal Asma'. He wrote a book in which he spoke about different issues of people, genealogy, language, and things like this, right? And in the beginning of the book, he wanted to seek Allah's barakah. So he began by talking about the Prophet 
in his life, in his name, in his lineage, in his genealogy. And that's where the book was taken from. So that is the material that we're going to use. Is the book in English? Has it been translated to English? I don't know. I'm not sure. I have to double check on that. What's important is the brothers who want to have the photocopy of the book, the PDF, we can supply you with the book, supply you with the link. You can put it on your phone or your smart tablet. Inshallah ta'ala, print it out. That way you can go back to it and have your own personal benefit. Brothers that know a little bit of Arabic, you're practicing, you still use the dictionary, brothers who know a lot of Arabic, inshallah, we'll try to supply you with the source. Bismillah. As far as tonight, then we're not going to read from no other place except for my favorite author, and that's Ibn Qayyim, Rahim al ta'ala. And he wrote an amazing, magnificent book on prophets, on the prophet's seerah. Anyone know what this book is called? Not stories of the prophet, la. That's from Ibn Kathir. And that's once more, like I just said, that's a selection from a huge, voluminous book. Al-Bidayah wa Nihaya. Huge, huge, huge book. Tayyip, anyone know what book Ibn Qayyim wrote on Sira? Now you're going to hit yourselves in the head when I give you the answer. Seer Nectar, that's not by Ibn Qayyim, that's by a contemporary. You know the answer, you're going to be upset with yourself when I tell you. Going once, going twice, sold. Zadul Ma'ad. Fi Hadi Khayr al Ibad. Zadul Ma'ad, right? I told you what? Alhamdulillah, he said, La hawla wa la quote illa billah. Most brothers would just hit themselves. Huh? Zadul Ma'ad. Huh? Provisions for the hereafter. Fi Hadi Khayr al Ibad. Concerning the guidance of the best of Allah's slaves. That's the whole book. Ibn Qayyim Rahim Allah, he wrote this book, some say when he was making Hajj on the back of a camel from Sham to Hijaz. What library did he have on the back of the camel? What air condition, what, what studio or computer or laptop or Google or software did he have? What books did he have access to? Huh? Meaning that he wrote the book what? We say from the top. Freestyle. I don't understand this. You got a pen in the pad writing. I'm what? Spitting from the top. It's not, they're not, la yastawi any methalan. And Allah says in the Quran, they are not what? They're not equal. They're not what, Mahdi? They're not equal. So he wrote this tremendous, scholastic, megaton bomb, major book that's studied today. They say he wrote it from his memory on the back of a camel in the hot sun, hopping up and down, bouncing up and down. You ever been on a camel? And I'm not talking about a camel at the Philadelphia Zoo. But a real biting, spitting camel. Uh, how bumpy the camel is, right? More bumpy than a horse. Hmm? And he wrote that book. So he called his book Zadul Ma'ad. Provisions for the hereafter. Fi hedi khayr al-ibad. Concerning the guidance of the best of Allah's servants. And as we've explained many times before, the scholars of Islam, of past and of present, they oftentimes give their titles, the titles of the books, rhythmic titles. That rhyme... And they are symbolic. Fathul al-Bari bi sharhi sahih al-Bukhari. Subul al-Salam ila bulug al-Maram. Allah Azza wa Jal, He inspired man to think, to feel. He gave man the ability to speak clearly. And He gave him the concept of rhymes. The power of a rhyme. Hmm? And that's what the Quraysh said about the Prophet He said at best, he's a poet. At best, if not mad, Dement, uh, delusional, etc. But at best, he's just a poet in his poetry, but it wasn't poetry. I don't understand this. So, therefore, the ulama of Islam, they would call their books, they would give their, their books titles that rhymed and made sense. So, listen, Zadul Ma'ad. You have the Ad, Fi Hadi Khayril, Ibad. I don't understand this. And it's also symbolic. And most people, they don't know that this book is about Sirah, it's a Sirah book. And when she talks about everything that pertains to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam He talks about Jabir, the people's need towards the Prophet And how the Prophet was the best of Allah's created beings And the blindness and the misguidance and the darkness that they roamed around in before the Prophet He talks about the Prophet's diet He talks about Islamic sexuality The sex life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and of the Muslim in that book and that is where that book comes from. What book? The Prophet's Medicine. 
That's not a separate book of Ibn Qayyim, as many people think, mistakenly, that's wrong. And not only is that inaccurate scientifically, but it also misleads you to implementing what you read in that book. That book is nothing more than a slice of a larger pie. The Prophet's guidance concerning prayer, zakah, fasting, hajj, jihad, dawah, and also medicine. And many people, they make a mistake regarding that book. Everything in that book and that chapter is not sent down from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is just an FYI or a fa'id on the side. The Prophet's medicine is of two types. The ulama of Islam, they say the Prophet's medicine that is clearly attached and attributed to something spiritual and supernatural, barakah, such as black seed. Black seed. He says, Inna hadhi al sawda. He says, this black seed is a cure of every sickness except for one sickness. And that sickness is what? Old age. Old age slash death, death slash old age. What's that black seed that the Prophet said that about? What's the black seed? You want to buy it now, you want to get it. The herb store, or you look online. What's the name of the seed? Sweet Sunnah, salt, the, the pepper shaker. Is that the black seed? What's the, what's the meta? What's the, what's, the meta? what's the black seed? I bought a book by a non Muslim. Stay with me, a non Muslim, a kafir, in which he wrote a whole book on the power of black seed. And he's not a Muslim. Huh? How many? Father? Black cumin? Anybody else? What about mustard seed? Some ulama say this is mustard seed. And many ulama, and perhaps it's the correct view, is that it's shunis. It's the name of it. Shunis. You can Google it. S H O O N E Z. Google it right now. Google shunis. Somebody Google it. I'm dead serious. Shunis. Google Shunis. See what you come up with. And this is another example off the topic of how you can have the hadith, you can have the proof, but that doesn't mean you have the proper understanding of it. Black seed. How many seeds are what? Black. How do you take the black seed? Do you eat it? Do you drink it? Do you press it? Cold press it? Everyone understand this? Drink the tea? It's a very powerful thing. Too much, too little, etc. Having a, having a dalil. The authentic narration is only what? Half the battle. The other half is the what? The fiqh of it. There are many things that have black seeds. Have what? An apple has what inside of it? All right, we're clear on this. Does it mean that? Apple seed? Linguistically, it says, habba to soda, black seed. And who says that it's the black seed that's sold with the label sweet sunnah? I'm not hating on sweet sunnah. I'm just making an example. We're not, we're not with hating. Huh? That's against our, our constitution. Hayden and La. We don't hate in the name of Ilm. Abedin. Huh? What you got about Shunis, Akhi? What you got? Bismillah. It says black seeds are Shunis. Black seeds are Shunis. What a rhyme. Allahu Akbar. That's Google, huh? S H O O N E Z. That's how I would spell it. Shunis. Show knees, I would say shoe knees, huh? It's like, what else you got? Let's hear what the non Muslims say about it. Yalla, yachi, your Google skills gotta. We need them to be strong, inshallah. Black coming, as he mentioned. So we have another name, scientific term, colloquial term, huh? Fadda. Those watching on the live stream can participate as well. What else you got, Yaqi? You're being stingy to us. Oh, man. Tell you, Al Muhim, at the end of the day, the first type of the, prophet, the Prophet's medicine is the medicine in which the Prophet speaks about that it's from Allah. And that it has a barakah. And that Allah has sent it down and Allah has placed it, etc. That is the Prophet's medicine, which it is the Sunnah. And a reward for you to take it and to adhere to it. And then the second type of prophetic medicine is that which was known in 7th century Arabia. That which was known in practice in 7th century Arabia. That which they came up with themselves, their own experiences. They got from the Greeks, the Egyptians, the Ethiopians. huh? And the people tried their best. 
and it's not necessarily a sunnah for you to implement this type of prophet's medicine. If you want to do it, do it. And if you want to go to the modern means, a pill, this tonic, this serum, you're open. Everyone understand this? It's something that the prophet did as a human being, as an Arab man, in that time and in that place. And this can save you from a lot of confusion. Everyone understand this? Let alone what Ibn Qayyim mentions in that book of things that he brought. And Ibn Qayyim wasn't from Arabia, nor did he live in the 7th century. Everyone understand this or not? Everyone understand this? Everyone clear this or not? So Ibn Qayyim, he added things to the book of his own knowledge, his own deduction and reasoning. He was a scholar of medicine as well. So everything in that book is not directly from the Prophet's authentic spiritual way. We said that as a fa'ida. So in this book, Zad al Ma'ad, that he wrote, speaking about Sirah, and I don't think the entire book is in English. I know parts are for sure. There's a summarized version of uh, Imam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab in English. And there are also parts of the complete version, but I don't think the whole thing is in English yet. As far as in Arabic, then it's in wide circulation. And as we said, this book is a book about what? Sirah. And there are many books on your shelf that you have that you may not have been properly trained in to know how to fully utilize them. And a tool is only as good as what? You use it. Sword is no value unless it's wielded what? Properly. I would understand this. Tayyip. Our Sheikh, Sheikh Abdul Muhsin Allah in Medina, he would advise the students of knowledge that when they went home to their countries in the summer, or if they stayed in Saudi for the summer, to read this book. To make it their business to read this book. A volume, a summer, or all of it in one summer, huh? Depending on how many hours out of the day you read as a student of knowledge. And as, as we know, many scholars quote from this book. Ibn Hajar and Fatul Bari always quotes from it. Uh, Sanani quotes from it in Subh al-Salam. They call it Fil Hadi. Call Ibn Qayyim Fil Hadi. Tayyip. Ibn Qayyim, he says, Faslun. ومن ها هنا تعلم الطرار العبادي فوق كل ضرورة إلى معرفة الرسول وما جاء به وتصديقه فيما أخبر به وطاعته فيما أمر فإنه لا سبيل إلى السعادة والفلاح لا في الدنيا ولا في الآخرة إلا على أيدي الرسل ولا سبيل إلى معرفة الطيب والخبيث على التفصيل إلا من جهتهم ولا ينال رضا الله البتة إلا على أيديهم فالطيب من الأعمال والأقوال والأخلاق ليس إلا هديهم وما جاءوا به فهم الميزان الراجح الذي على أقوالهم وعمالهم وأخلاقهم توزن الأقوال والأخلاق والأعمال وبمتابعتهم يتميز أهل الهدى من أهل الضلال فالضرورة إليهم أعظم من ضرورة البدن إلى روحه والعين إلى نورها والروح إلى حياتها فأي ضرورة وحاجة فرضت فضرورة العبد وحاجته إلى الرسل فوقها بكثير Listen to these golden words Words that some of the ulama will say regarding تكتب بماء العينين Words so precious, so valuable that if you had to make ink with the tears out of your eyes it would be worth it how much water is in your eyes? You just blinked. Right? Something gets in your eye, you blinked again. So I hit dust gets in your eyes, right? What do you do? Your eye starts what? Watering and watering and watering. But no matter how much your eye waters, it's not but so much what? Water in your eyes. But words so valuable that a person could mix ink up with that water and write it down. That's how valuable it is. Or as Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhu said, he says, when you hear something, then write it down, even if it's on the wall. And one narration says, one of the Salaf of Salih, whether it was Ibn Abbas or others, my poor memory doesn't serve me well right now, that he would write so much, he would write in his hands when he ran out of paper. There was no Staples or Office Max back then. There was no Amazon Prime. You had to get the paper, pay for it, paper it, or whatever. It's very difficult and costly to write. And that's why the ulama of hadith, when you see the manuscripts, you see them writing above, below, all around. Every single centimeter is used. Huh? He says that he would write it down in his scroll. And when he ran out of paper, he would write it on his hands. 
And when he ran out of space on his hands, he would write it on the bottom of his sandal. Because it was that valuable. It was that what? It was that valuable. Ibn Qayyim, he says, Woman ha'una. He says, and from this angle, and from this perspective, from this, huh? From this way, min ha'una, what he previously mentioned, he says, you can know, and you can realize the utter and extreme necessity for the people to know and to study and to come across and to familiarize themselves with that which the messengers brought. The message of the messengers above all other needs and extremes. You need water, you need bread, you need food to survive, fat, sugar, oils, carbs, whatever. You need oxygen, you need air, you need sleep. These are all extreme necessities of the human being. You need to relieve yourself. But knowing about the Prophet, knowing about his seerah, knowing about his way, he says that it does what? It trumps all of them. Learning a seerah comes before what? Anything and everything. Alaikum salam wa Hayakallah Sheikh. Everyone clear on this? Learning the way of Muhammad and the way of the messengers, he says it supersedes all other necessities, which are clearly what? Necessities. But there's a prioritizing regarding these necessities. He says that which the messenger came with, and to believe in it, and to obey him. And there's no way that a person can be happy in this life and thereafter except via the hands of the messengers. He said the Rusul, and he didn't say anyone else. You cannot live happily. You cannot die happily unless you're following the messengers. Everyone understand this? Following this person, this one, my father, my imam, my scholar, my this, my that. He says the messengers. What they said, what they did, what they brought, and what they taught. He says there's no way that you can have a happy life. <laughs> In this one, nor in the next. He says, and there's no way for you to know the good from the bad in detail except from them. You can understand things in general because Allah has given the human being a fitra, a natural discerning mechanism to know that this just isn't right. And it does not need an encyclopedia to figure out that this is what? This is wrong. This is not Islam. There's no way. That I left Christianity for this. There's no way that I left being an atheist for this. There's no way that I left and I escaped those bullets whizzing past my head. Huh? To do this and to practice. That's impossible. I would understand this. That's impossible. And it doesn't take a great detailed knowledge or level of knowledge to understand basic things in Al-Islam. The fitrah. Let alone common what? Sense. That Allah has given the human being. Like he's given animals, animal instinct. Do we know what this is? Animals have an instinct to sense and to smell danger and harm. They're naturally created to sense when something is going wrong. And it's not the right the direction to go in. They know this. So no matter how kind you try to be to the lamb or the sheep on the eed, you walk with it carefully, you hide your knife. What corner you go in, the animal smells death in the air. Let alone the blood. He knows it's about to get slaughtered. And that's why you find certain animals that will put up a great fight and others will walk peacefully. He knows that he's going to slaughter it. So you try your best to be kind to the animal, but the animal has the instinct. Or you go on a farm and the animal runs away from you. Just now, we were in New Jersey on the heat day. Huh? Alameen, he picked out a sheep. The sheep was so wild and fast and fierce. Wallahi alameen, it almost ran through the metal fence twice. His body was halfway through the metal fence. You know a metal farming fence? We have like the, it's like each section, it's like a block. Hi, teacher, assalamu alaikum. Good to see you, teacher. We have some tea for you. Bismillah. Right? The, the sheep almost ran through the fence just to get away. I didn't have no knife with me. There was no blood on me. But he knew what? Someone was trying to have lamb chops tonight. He sensed this. So therefore, he says, is that the only way that you can have things, the knowledge of good and bad in detail, he says, is through the messengers. You can learn things basically through your fitrah and through common sense. But those things that was obeyed are going to be what? In general and not in detail. He says here, and it's no way that a person can obtain Allah's good pleasure except through them. So therefore, 
the good statement, the good act, the good deed, the good character to have is nothing more than what they did and what they said and how they behaved. Listen to these words. That's the correct way. What the messengers did, that's the way to live and that's the way to die. He says, and everything that a person or the statements and actions of people, character, he says, it has to be weighed. It has to be measured on their scale. Is it a good statement? Go to the scale. Is it a good act? Go to the scale. Is this zud? Should I not eat meat? Should I be a vegetarian? Should I live a monastic life, not get married? Should I go here? Should I do this? Should I say this? Use the what? The scale. And the scale is a just and accurate scale. Precise scale. That is the way to live. And that's the way to die. How do I know that I'm not a failure in life? That I'm living a meaningful life? Because I'm imitating you, or this one, or this athlete, or this musician, or this person, or this whoever he is. Or Muhammad's way. Even the Christians, unfortunately, oftentimes they may understand this better than some Muslims. And that's why you see the bumper stickers, what would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? Some of the Christians may understand this better than some of us. What would Jesus do in this situation? What would he what? What would he do in what? They use Jesus' life as a what? A scale. What you say, what you do, let's see what Jesus would have said and what he would have, what he, what he, what he would have done. As an indigenous American once said, he was a chief of a great tribe, Native American, and when the European settlers came upon his land and they made promises and broke those promises and they sold and they traded and they bartered, etc., and he proved himself to be extremely treacherous and raping and plundering and murdering and finally trying to justify him taking the land and kicking him off of the land, Christianity. That you're a heathen, you're a pagan, and you must accept this man whose message, whose name is Jesus. You have to accept his way. And as, as long as we're Christians, and you're a heathen, an idol worshiper, you have no right to your land or your property or nothing. So the chieftain, do you know what he said to him? He says, this man Jesus, based off of what you say about him and his character, I think that if Jesus was alive, he would be an Indian. Based off of what you say about him, that he was generous, he was kind, he never molested women, he never did this to his enemies, he did that, he forgave, he forbear, so on and so forth. Everything that you say about this man is what is in our culture. No one owns the land. No one owns the mountains or the rivers. It's for everybody. I don't understand this. The point I'm trying to get to is that hit man, he used that as the skill. No matter what you're saying of Christianity, Waikum Salam Rasulullah, Christianity, and you're right, you have the right to own and possess, he used the what? A skill. Based off of what you say about your, your Lord and Savior, you're not living right. So he says that that's the ultimate way of determining what is a good statement and what is a bad statement. What is a good way to behave and what's a what? A bad way to behave. Ibn Qayyim Rahim al then says, and with regards to following the messengers, it is clear the people of guidance from the people of misguidance. The messengers following them. He says, so therefore, the necessity of what the messengers brought and what they said and how they taught it is above all other necessities. The necessity of the body to the spirit, the eye to light, the soul to life of the soul. He says, what necessity, any necessity you can think about or ponder, bring up in your mind, it cannot come before this necessity. He says, فوقها بكثيرين. He says, many degrees above. It may just be a close what? Close decision. I have the option between Food and water. I'll take the food, but what? Barely. He says, no. Knowing what the messengers brought in general, and what Muhammad brought, he says, what? Be kathir. Above all other necessities. He says, and what do you think about a man? What do you think about a person? What do you possibly say about an individual whose guidance, when it's taken away from you, then you become like a fish that's pulled out of water? 
the man's guidance that's so important to you that if it's taken away from you from one moment, Tarfat Ayn, you just did it again, Jabba. Keep blinking. You just did that. That short period of time, you live without Muhammad's guidance. He says, you'll be like a fish that's pulled out of water. Well, will the Afid Miklat and thrown into the pan? Hmm? Thrown into the what? Frying pan. To be consumed. Doom, death. He says, that's the need of the Prophet Sallallahu in his knowledge, his legacy, for that split second, let alone, Ahi, you live an entire day without the Prophet's guidance. You live an entire week without the Prophet's guidance. A month without the Prophet's guidance. A year without the Prophet's guidance. A'udhu billah, it's scary. Five years, ten years, and you haven't learned or done or practiced anything from Muhammad's way. How long will the fish survive when it's put on deck? How long will it survive? Ibn Qayyim Rahim al then says, فَحَالُ الْعَبْدِ عِنَّ مُفَارَقَةِ قَلْبِهِ لِمَا جَاءَ بِهِ الرُّسُلِ كَهَذِهِ الْحَالِ بَلْ أَعْظَمْ وَلَكِنْ لَا يُحِسُّ بِهَذَا إِلَّا قَلْبُ حَيٍّ وَمَا لِجُرْحٍ بِمَيِّتٍ إِلَامُ He says, so therefore, the slave's need is like this. If the slave is poor, if the slave is destitute, without the Prophet's guidance, then he's like the fish put out the water and thrown into the frying pan. He says, He says, rather, it's even more dangerous. He says, however, the only people that can realize this and understand this and realize the depth of this is someone whose heart is alive. And he quotes a line of poetry. He says, a dead body never fills a pinch. A dead body never fills a what? A pinch. A corpse. Someone who's dead. You can pinch him, poke him, it feels no what? It's nothing there. Think about when you sit down for a long time and your foot does what? Falls asleep, you get up, your foot feels heavy. It's hard to walk because your foot it did what? Fell asleep. You can pinch your foot and you won't feel what? You won't feel anything. So someone whose heart is dead, someone whose heart has been strangled and suffocated through sin and love of the dunya and heedlessness from Allah's dhikr and ignorance, He's not going to feel this. He may go 24 hours and he doesn't feel out of shape or out of place being away from the Prophet's guidance. Think about a believer when you miss a salat, if you miss a salat, what the other belah, how stressed out you are. You feel bad. Oh man, I overslept. SubhanAllah. I missed a day in Ramadan. I made a sin. I made a mistake. I went back to this. You feel bad. Hmm? You feel what? You feel bad. And this is from the wisdom as some of the ulama of Islam say, why Allah Azza wa decreed upon the Prophet and the companions to oversleep that day for Salat al Fajr. They were returning home from a battle and they were very tired and they went to sleep and he gave instructions to the companions to Bilal to wake me up. Ah, but we know the companions, they didn't want to wake up the Prophet because when he was asleep, he was dreaming and his dreams was what? Why? Revelation. Everyone understand this? So therefore, the Prophet ﷺ, he overslept. And the companions overslept. The Prophet woke up. Ya Bilal, didn't I tell you to wake me up? He said, oh, Messenger of Allah. He says, I was afflicted with that which you were afflicted. I was tired too, oh, Messenger of Allah. He fell asleep. And then they got up, and they traveled. They made the adhan, etc. And they offered the salat that they had missed. Some of the ulama of Islam, they say, from the wisdom in this, is for believers never to despair. And never to kill themselves out of grief if they make a mistake or their human nature takes over them. If the Prophet did it, then you should not what? Don't kill yourself over it. You'd be worried, concerned, but don't what? Don't kill yourself over it. Everyone understand this wisdom? This, this, this wisdom here? And that's why it states in certain narrations, he says that I'm a human being like you. I forget like you forget. And when I forget, then remind me. And it states in another narration that I forget to legislate. The Prophet forgot in the Salah. That was a blessing upon the Muslims for him to forget. They said, oh, Messenger of Allah. Huh? Abu Bakr wouldn't speak. Umar wouldn't speak. The people left the masjid. He made the salams after two rak'ah. The people were afraid. The people were afraid to speak. But there was a man whose name was al khirbaq his hands were huge, brolic hands, huh? 
bare hands, real big hands. You know brothers like this, right? I'm sure you know a brother like that, really big hands. He had the courage to speak to the Prophet ﷺ. And he said, O Messenger of Allah, have you forgotten or has the prayer been shortened? Have you forgotten or what? He says, Lam ansa. He says, I didn't forget, nor was the prayer shortened. And he said to him, Nay, rather, O Messenger of Allah, what? Knowledge doesn't stop because the lights go off, eh, Khan? Huh? And it doesn't stop just because we're in the dark. Alhamdulillah, for the light that we have. I had a teacher once in Medina when we were in a class studying a takhrij, and the different students, they were bringing their laptops, they were bringing their computers and their tablets, etc. He said, these things, they seem good. This is in the early days of the iPad and stuff, and the, the, the advanced software. He said, they seem good. He says, but what do you do when you go somewhere, you're doing a class, you're doing a lecture, a workshop, and electricity cuts off? And you don't have anything in your chest or your heart. And then what do you do? Uh, that's why many of the salaf, they would say, the knowledge that you can't take inside the hammam isn't what? It isn't knowledge. They would say the knowledge that you can't take in the bathroom isn't actually what? Meaning that you got to have it where? No matter where you go. I don't need an iPad. Cut it off. I don't need a pen and a pad. Do you understand this? As we said earlier, from the what? From the top. Tell you. So with that being said, with that being said, the Prophet ﷺ, he said, I didn't forget, and the, short, the prayer was not shortened. And he says, rather, you have forgotten, O Messenger of Allah. And then, he asked the people, As-Sadaqa Dhul Yadaini, the man with extra hands, double-sized hands, has he told the truth? And he says, he has spoken the truth, O Messenger of Allah. And that's when the Prophet ﷺ, he finished the Turaqa, and he made the sujood of Sahu. And that is a sunnah and a legislation for us to this day. So Allah decreed upon him that error as a what? As a mercy. As a what? As a mercy. For someone who's dead, someone whose heart is dead, someone who's been beat down by sin and disobedience, he doesn't feel anything. It's like another day to me. And we ask Allah to protect us from that. Ibn Qayyim then says, وَإِذَا كَانَتْ سَعَادَةُ الْعَبْدِ فِي الدَّارَيْنِ مُعَلَّقَةً بِهَدِّ النَّبِيِّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمُ فَيَجِبُ عَلَى كُلِّ مَن نَصَحَ نَفْسَهُ وَأَحَبَّ نَجَاتَهَا وَسَعَادَتَهَا أَنْ يَعْرِفَ مِنْ هَدْيِهِ وَسِيرَتِهِ وَشَانِهِ مَا يَخْرُجُ بِهِ عَنِ الْجَاهِلِ نَبِيهِ وَيَدْخُلَ بِهِ فِي عِدَادِ أَتْبَاعِهِ وَشِيعَتِهِ وَحِزْبِهِ وَالنَّاسُ فِي هَذَا بَيْنَ مُسْتَقِلٍ وَمَسْتَكْفِرٍ وَمَحْرُومٍ وَالْفَضْلُ بِيَدِ اللَّهِ يُؤْتِيهِ مَنْ يَشَاءُ وَاللَّهُ ذُو الْفَضْلِ الْعَظِيمِ He ends the chapter in a paragraph by saying And if this is the case if the servant can only be happy in both worlds, because you could be happy in this world but miserable in the hereafter, or miserable in this world but at least what? Happy in the hereafter. And obviously, there are some people whom Allah gives what? Gives both. Allah Akbar. Happy in both worlds, even happy in the hereafter. He says, if the servant's happiness is based off of the Prophet's guidance, he says, then anyone who respects himself and what's good for him or herself, then he must know a basic standard to remove himself of ignorance regarding the Prophet ﷺ. For you not to be from the jahileen, the ignorant people, those who know nothing about the Prophet ﷺ. Everyone, if you really want good for yourself and if you respect yourself, then you have to have a basic standard of knowledge of the Prophet ﷺ and his guidance. No? So if that's the basic level, then that means the more knowledge of the Prophet, the more detailed ilm you have of the seerah, then you're supposed to be what? Happier. And further from Allah's punishment. And closer to Allah's what? Man yuridillahu bihi khayran, faqihu fi deen. Allah wants good for the servant he gives him, fiqh for the deen, in the deen. Ibn Qaymi then says, for a person not to be from the jahileen regarding the Prophet, and for one to be included in the followers of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Listen to these two words in the claim he mentions. This is not me. Uh, like last time we were here, we don't make up things. This is the word for word translation. He says to be from the Shia of the Prophet Sallallahu And to be from the Hizb of the Prophet Alayhi Salatu Huh? Imagine if I said that in a khutbah or class. We have to be from the Shia of the Prophet. It's upon us to be Shia of the Messenger. What they would say, ah, he's calling you to be a Shi'i. He's slandering Abu Bakr and Umar. 
Huh? And the ignorant fool doesn't even realize that the word Shia is mentioned in the Quran. Wa in the Shiatihi? Huh? What's the verse? Allah says, and indeed from his Shia is who? It's Ibrahim. Meaning from his followers. That's what the word Shi'i linguistically means. A follower. A devoted follower. That's why they call themselves Shia. We are followers, lovers, companions, supporters of Ahlul Bayt. And that's why the proper term of a Shi'i is Rafidi. Especially today. That's a term that they don't like. Everyone understand this? They don't. Uh, many people, they think that the different groups and the schisms, and they, say, they think that they call themselves, we call them. No. They call themselves Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. They call themselves the followers of the Prophet. They call them, you give them the name Shia, Khawarish. That's not what they what? Call themselves. Ignorance. Everyone understand this? They believe that they're, what they're doing is correct. Everyone understand this or not? So what Shia means a follower, a group, followers, party. So there's an, an honorific title to them. But instead they're Rafidah because they refuse. Who did they refuse? They didn't refuse the Prophet. If they refused the Prophet, they wouldn't be called Muslims. Who Sahaba? Who? La. That's on the surface, so you know that's not the answer. It's too easy. La. They refuse someone else. That's how they got the name Rafida, because the word Rafida, Rafadad, Rafada to refuse. Who did they refuse? La. A right hand jab, but you know that. La. Moving forward. Ibn Qayyim says, from the Shia of the Messenger and from the Messengers, his, from his party. Huh? He says, and the people regarding this, this is the last sentence, he says, the people regarding this issue are one of three. So before I translate this, I want you to ask yourself, which of the three are you? Which of the three am I? He says, mustaqillin, wa mustakfirin, wa mahrumin. People that only do a little, people that have an abundance, and people that are totally deprived, totally deprived, unlucky, left out, mustaqil. I know a little bit about the Prophet Sirah, Muhammad ibn Abdullah, uh, Abdul Muttalib. He was born in this year, the year of the elephant, kada wa kada, skimming on the surface because you only read a little bit. And in the lectures that you listen to, if you listen to a lecture three hours a day, Two hours and 30 minutes is about something else. In most cases, subhanAllah, the lectures in most cases that you listen to about someone else's life, besides Muhammad. And then you wonder why you don't know much about his what? About his life. And those lectures, as we read, could be what? Important. And this person's life could be a benefit. But the durura, the necessity is what? He says what? Way above. Are we understand these words? We understand these words? So he says, so those who only read and listen and learn a little bit about the seerah, mustaqil. And then there's the opposite, mustakbir. All of the day, three hours, five hours, I listen to lectures on YouTube or on podcasts, driving to work, on the train, riding on my bike, jogging, whatever I do, I'm listening about the seerah, 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 seerah. Prophet's life, Uhud, Badr, Ahzab, Hudaybiyah, Flint, Flint, seerah, 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 seerah. I have a problem with my wife in the household, seerah. My children, Sira. At the masjid, Sira. My neighbors, Sira. Muslims being minorities, Sira. And then last but not least, we have the the good, the bad, and the what? The ugly. That's right. So is mahroom. They have no knowledge of the Prophet or the other Billah. Whatsoever. That's sad. May Allah protect us from being like that. Ibn Qayyim concludes this by saying, and the bounty is in the hands of Allah Azza wa Jal. He gives it to whom he wills, to whom he pleases. And this goes to show you the ugliness of an envious person. As the ulama of Islam say, someone who's ugly, who's envious, a green-eyed monster, as we say, the worst things that he has to deal with is that he's displeased and angry with Allah. It has nothing to do with you. His sickness is deeper than that. Allah chose this individual for this virtue. And you hate that person, and you envy him, and you're jealous. In actuality, you're displeased with what? 
what Allah gave. Allah's bounty is in his hand and he gives it to what? And this is what prevented the Quraysh from accepting Islam. Allah says, these individuals, Allah bless them without us. This is what they said about this companion and that companion, Bilal radiallahu anhu, and Ibn Ibn Maktoum, and Ammar, and so on and so forth. Everyone understand this? He said these about the companions, this servant, this peasant, this one, that one. And we are the nobles of Quraysh. And he gave them Iman and not us. They were displeased with Allah's Qadr. Allah says, Does Allah not know who's grateful from those who are ungrateful? So the bounty is in the hand of Allah. And he gives it to whomever he pleases. Wallahu dhul fadl al azim And Allah is the possessor of limitless bounty. Inshallah ta'ala, our next class, it will be announced. Bidhan ta'ala, when it will be. And we will actually begin the book and actually roll up our sleeves, inshallah, and get busy with the seerah of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam and the benefits that we can take therefrom. I thank everyone for listening, for watching, for being attentive and participating, for your respect and good thoughts of us. Jazakumullahu khayran. May Allah give you both the reward and the tangible knowledge. And Allah surely knows best. I don't know if we have time for questions after the adhan. Uh, let's see how that goes, inshallah ta'ala. Those who are online, if they want to hold on to after the event, inshallah ta'ala, we'll see how that works. Jazakumullahu khairan.